Greetings, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, book launch of Victor Strazzeri's uh, Young Max Weber, which is being hosted and sponsored by the Historical Materialism book series. My name is Tom Kempel. I'm a professor of sociology, and I teach and publish on social theory at the University of British Columbia, which is on unceded Musqueam territory in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, my book, Marx's Wager, which I have here, Das Kapital and Classical Sociology was published just a few months ago. I would like to think of it as a continuation of Victor's book, but I can't actually claim that. Um, we're going to start with uh, 20, about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes from our uh, featured author today. Uh, Victor Strazzeri is project coordinator and editor at the Berlin Institute of Critical Theory and an associate professor at the University of Bern. The Young Max Weber in German Social, Social Democracy is a revised and expanded version of his PhD dissertation, which he defended at the Free University of Berlin in 2017. After Victor speaks, we're going to hear from uh, our two panelists. Uh, they'll speak for about 10 to 15 minutes each. Um, we'll start with Sarah Ferris, who is Associate Professor in Sociology at Goldsmiths and author of In the Name of Women's Rights, The Rise of Femo Nationalism, that's from Duke University Press in 2017, and of Max Weber's Theory of Personality, which was published by Brill in 2013. Following Sarah, we'll hear from Angela Zimmerman, who is Professor of History at George Washington University. She's the author of Alabama in Africa, Booker T. Washington, The German Empire, and the Globalization of the New South, published by Princeton in 2010, and the editor of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, The Civil War in the United States, published by International Publishers in 2016. She's currently writing a history of the Civil War as an international anti-slavery uh, revolution. Um, after we hear from our panelists, we're gonna have about uh, uh, 30 to 45 minutes of conversation and questions uh, from you, the audience. So please do uh, um, think of your questions uh, and um, post them. And I'll be reading them out loud. We'll start with Victor, it's over to you. Thanks, Tom. Um, thanks for the, the introduction. And I just wanna say how happy I am um, first, thank HM for the possibility to publish this book, which is a revised version of my uh, PhD dissertation in, in the HM book series. So thanks to Paul and to Sebastian and to Sarah. Um, and it's really a tremendous joy uh, to be finally uh, discussing this kind of with a, with a live audience and especially with this panel, because it gathers uh, people who are essential for the, the makeup of the book, the way I think about Weber and many other things. So thanks everyone. And this has really helped me get my mind of uh, what's been happening in Brazil uh, since the day before yesterday, though yesterday there was a, there was a response that has uh, helped put uh, the fascists in their place. And let's hope uh, that remains so. Um, but going back to the book, so just to talk about it more generally, the goal of the book or the idea behind the research itself is to reframe the Marx Weber debate. How is that how is that debate usually usually framed, right? The the relationship between the thought of, of Marx and Weber. Um, it's basically the the let's say the stereotypical version of that debate is that Weber is the bourgeois Marx, right? Uh, Albert Solomon came up with that um, with that nickname. And it's not entirely false in the sense that he's an alternative. Um, I'm not amongst those Marxist readers of Weber who thinks a fusion is, is possible, though many, many have attempted with interesting results, and we can go into the Q&A as to why I don't think that fusion is possible. But what bothers me in, this, in the usual way that their relationship is framed is that Weber comes in as the thinker who, other, um, in contrast to Marx, who prioritized only the economic factor and the you know the role of the base of uh, productive relations over the superstructure juridical ideological uh cultural etc and weber comes in as kind of a corrective that says wait no not as in some occasions in some situations the material factors so-called do influence uh 
intellectual fact or ideal factors or but in other situations, it's the other way around. Um, so this is kind of like stereotypical Weber comes in as a corrective to Marx. And so uh, the way that, that that's framed is that the Marxists that are actually not that deterministic, um, they got that from Weber. So it's not a coincidence then that Gramsci, for example, especially like Georg Lukacs and the Frankfurt School, they were influenced by Weber. Therefore, they pay more attention to not exclusively economic factors or the or uh, they're not they're less determinist in some way so weber comes in in this very um convenient position as the corrective to the limits of marxism and this is a very uh this is a very re reductionist view of this relationship that's much more complex and the book tries to um contribute to or, or tries to um, explain why that is so. And so I, I have a quote from Heine in the book, Heinrich Heine, which I like that starts helping us understand this relationship. The quote, um, he was referring to the relationship between Spinoza and Descartes. And he says, uh, genius fashions itself through another great genius, less by assimilation than by friction. And the point here is not these great geniuses and how their ideas um, um, come into contact with each other, but this idea of friction, this is definitely how um, Weber shaped his thought and how many Marxists that read Weber um, benefited from that. And the question though that the book tries to approach, and this is, uh, the book has three parts. Um, I'm gonna go into what, they are a little bit different and have different goals. So I'll go into these three parts before we move in uh, to the other speakers. Um, is what is the context then that this friction took place? Uh, it's not simply a relationship between uh, two intellectuals that takes place in a vacuum. And the what I, my suspicion before I started the research was that the fact that Weber grew up uh, in the 1880s and 1890s in Imperial Germany, and especially, most specifically, in Berlin, in Berlin or in, um, in a municipality adjacent to it at the time, um, he grew up exactly at a time where social conflict in Imperial Germany and recently unified Imperial Germany was at, was at an all-time high. And especially where you had a political subject, um, a political party, mass party, the first um, socialist mass party that actually um, professed to be following the ideas of Karl Marx, um, German social democracy. The, the rise of this party into a central political actor in Imperial Germany takes place exactly in Weber's maturing years. And uh, my hypothesis was that it cannot be that he um, was left totally uninfluenced by this. Weber is usually described in the literature as this, um, as this bourgeois um, who, who lived in this enclave, uh, tranquil enclave near Berlin. And he's a product, he's almost like a virgin birth of um, uh, bourgeois class consciousness, let's uh, put it like that. And that is not the case. And I have a little anecdote that I start the book with that shows that I'm not the first to have this um, um, intuition. This is, a, this is an anecdote that we have from Mariana Weber's biography of Weber. Um, Mariana, uh, a key social thinker herself, is, was also a biography of Weber. Um, she, she tells this anecdote that um, Weber's birth had been difficult and had left his mother, Helena, too weak to breastfeed. So, quote, this would stun by another woman, the wife of a social democratic car carpenter. When later his social democratic views developed in opposition to the political heritage of his ancestors, the family used to joke that, Ma that Max drank his political views with his nurse's milk. And so, while we don't know if this uh, the veracity of the story is relied on Mariana, it's very symbolic of the um, asymmetrical but also very intimate relationship between the liberal bourgeoisie and the working classes in Imperial Germany. And the book, in a way, tries to tease out that anecdote and give it some more substance. Uh, I do that in the in the first part of the book by going through Weber's letters from when he was a student and when he was writing his PhD and doing his uh, legal clerkship years. Weber was a, a law major, and what I what he does during this in his correspondence in this period is he has a running commentary on the political situation of Imperial Germany, and I tried to tease out all the relevant moments where he talks about 
workers, where he talks about uh, the social democrats and uh, tried to find if he had read Marx at this point, uh, which I don't think he had. And, or at least not until the early 1890s. I go into all of that in the book. I, I quote profusely in the book. So um, you guys can also make make up your own mind about most of the things that, that I say here. It's important to say that I used, this book wouldn't have been possible without a revolution in the sources. The critical Weber, uh, edition of Weber's work uh, is now out. And the book is also a way to get to a lot of interesting things that have come up in this critical edition, or at least are easier to find than in the things that were published before. Um, and so, most of them have never been uh, published in English. Um, and so what I reconstruct in the letters is how Weber, who is, comes from a liberal family, his father is a, a liberal parliamentarian, um, he, he comes of age in a, in a moment where liberalism in Germany is in a, is in a moment of crisis. Uh, conservative liberalism had supported Bismarck uh, in the name of German unification, kind of sacrificing um, their bond to democracy and to a broader solution that would have included Austria. And, but at this moment in time in the 1880s, Bismarck has broken with the, with the liberals. He no longer needs them. And it's going in a more conservative direction. But at the same time, he's trying to win over workers. He did so in the, in the, at the moment of German unification by introducing universal suffrage. So you have an imperial system that is not democratic at all, but has universal suffrage. It's uh, tough to explain, but this is important. Um, and then uh, he's, he begins introducing also social policy measures. Uh, state social policy measures. So the first uh, so form of social insurance, first uh, old age pension uh, system are introduced by Bismarck at this time. The temperature of class struggle has directly related to this and the fact that this, this threat from below that uh, Bismarck hopes to neutralize uh, by introducing these measures. And the liberals are totally against them, basically. And what I show in part one is how Weber slowly breaks with uh, his liberal um, uh, father and uh, family and how he too be, uh, starts to recognize that the social question, the so-called social question, so the fact that under capitalism, you have this um, never before seen production of wealth that is also producing poverty at an alarming rate and a poverty that has a, a, a specific form, this worker had, that doesn't own their means of production and a form also that is producing um, resistance and now in Germany organized resistance in the shape of this political party. And the part one basically traces how Weber goes from ignoring this phenomenon or a uh, view aligned with this uh, liberal uh, father and uncle to recognizing more and more that you have to take workers as political actors into account and that their standpoint must count in some way to the um, to the fate of the of Imperial Germany. And so part two, though, when he finishes his legal studies, Weber does something that even in the scholarship is not very clear why he did that. He gets involved in empirical social research. So he was a legal scholar writes mainly on ancient on ancient history or in medieval history. And he takes up this research on uh, the so called rural labor question. So in Imperial Germany at this time, you have massive migration from the countryside to the cities, and you're starting to have labor shortage in, um, in rural Germany, especially in the East, which is the seat of Prussian aristocracy. And you're starting to have problems with the discipline of workers. This was how employers saw the labor question. The labor question was the fact that they can't get enough uh, workers at, a, at fair wages for them and that they're becoming indisciplined. And Weber come, so there's a, a research initi initiative by an association of, uh, uh, for political research, kind of a civil society associ association, the Verein für Sozialpolitik, Association for Social Policy, that does interviews with the landowners to see why, uh, try to understand this phenomenon. And Weber gets the commission to work on the reports that came in from um, East Albion, Germany, so from the German East, exactly where the Prussian aristocrats, the backbone of uh, imperial power of uh, Bismarck himself is a Prussian aristocrat. So he gets the most, the toughest 
um, assignment. And he has to work through these uh, reports and say, what's wrong with the workers? Why, why are they behaving in this way? What can be done uh, about it? And what, what happens though, is that Weber introduces a, a, different, a different point of view into the discussion that workers are not only an objective factor into in the project, productive process, an issue that you have to resolve uh, and through either through repression or through economic incentives, that you have to understand what they're thinking, what they're feeling um, in order to give a proper response to the so-called labor question. And this is, again, very typical of what uh, one historian called the 1890 generation, uh, which Weber belongs to. It's a generation that understood that the social question was a central one um, in in modern times and in uh, in cap for capitalism, or that capitalism brought with it the social question as a central issue. You could not get around. Uh, you could not get around. And what I show is that exactly at this moment, what Weber realizes is that um, it's not really because only economic factors uh, that are at play here. Weber realizes that workers are, even when they're in a good economic position, they still choose to migrate because uh, they, they crave a greater personal freedom that is available either in the cities or when they migrate abroad. And, and so it's at this moment that Weber uh, realizes that you have what he calls ethical ideal factors in, in agency that can be decisive also in large scale social transformation. And this is what I argue is the moment that Weber realizes that culture can play a central role in human agency and that it can trump, let's say, economic factors uh, in um, driving individuals uh, or as a driver for individuals agency. So against the grain of the literature that would trace his, um, his contribution to social science and to the role of culture for agency, that traces that back to the Protestant ethic and to how he found that in ethic in uh, static um, Protestant entrepreneurs. My point is that he found that exactly by taking the standpoint of the lowly rural worker into account. But um, so far so good. And the issue here though, is that Weber at, this, at the same time during the 1890s has, uh, these studies are also known for their uh, xenophobic, um, racist remarks with regards to especially the Polish migrant workers that the landowners were bringing in to um, uh, to repress wages and to fulfill, to fill those uh, those gaps in the in the labor force due to the migration of the uh, quote unquote native workers and Weber in this uh, Weber takes a position there that that um, the the borders have to be closed and that the the Polish workers are dry, not only driving down um, the wages of workers; they're driving they're driving down the cultural level of uh, of the German East, and so they're in a way uh, affecting German culture. And and so here's where it gets kind of problematic, and and the the literature has had trouble um, dealing with this, um, especially this kind of remark has been attributed to prejudices of Weber, or Weber was a nationalist at this point, he'll overcome that, uh, and things of the sort. But there's actually uh, a very systematic reasoning behind the way Weber views the relationship between culture, between labor, and between ethnicity or race that I try to reconstruct here based on the work, um, on, the, on the critical work on Weber um, that has been produced lately, and trying to, and um, the participants in the stream here are among the chief uh, responsible for that. Um, but what Weber realized, or at least what he saw in his study, was that there was a productivity differential between workers um, from the German East. As, as far The farther east you went to and the more ethnically mixed the population became, the productivity of, la of the rural laborers went down. And so his, his conclusion from that is, there, is that culture must be a factor then in productivity, and he connected culture directly to ethnicity, which he conceived in a very racialized uh, perspective. So part three tries to work through all of that and, and reconstruct what is not simply prejudice, but what is a normative concept of culture based on a kind of a sliding scale um, that is uh, drawn across ethnic racial lines.
And this is inseparable then from conceiving, uh, from looking at capitalism and labor and culture in an age where it's not just that capitalist relations are spreading everywhere, but where you have um, colonialism and imperialism really kicking into high gear. Um, the Berlin Conference was just uh, a few years before in 1884. Uh, Imperial Germany is embarking on colonial expansion as well. So one of the things I uh, stress on the book is that Weber is not just a, th a theoretician of capitalism, um, or or how capitalism breaks with traditional societies, but he's a someone who theorized capitalism when capitalism was already in an imperialist phase. And this feeds into how he understands culture, but also how he understands class struggle. So just to finish, um, one of the things that um, I bring into the book that it will, will perhaps be um, unknown to, to most readers of Weber is how uh, how much actually he read Engels's work and not just Marx. So Weber not only read Marx, now what we know through the critical edition is that he taught Marx and was very knowledgeable about classics of socialism and anarchist thought. And he had, though he, he specifically liked, uh, and I go through what exactly in Capital did he find more useful and less, but the thing that drew my attention the most is uh, how eagerly he read Engels, but he read Engels uh, inverting him politically. And this is a point, just to finish, uh, talking about this, the centrality of imperialism to, to Weber's thought. Um, Weber read Engels. Uh, Engels is trying to figure out in the 1890s, so Engels is still alive at this moment, why uh, a mass socialist party like you have in Germany didn't um, arise or had not yet arisen in, in Britain, which was the most advanced capitalist country. And what Engels says is a, the reason for that is, a, well, a combination of the repression of the Chartist movement in the 40s, but especially the fact that surpluses from imperialism enabled um, British capitalism to foster a, a, a social strata or a strata of workers, of higher standing workers, uh, so-called higher standing workers, who had a, a greater say in 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 the in, in politics who could could had the right to collective bargaining they were uh, unionized and these surpluses that are impossible to have without imperialism enabled a middle strata between unskilled workers who were more unruly and revolutionary and uh, the bourgeoisie and the other uh, um, proprietary uh, classes of um, uh, landowners uh, the aristocracy etc so Engels is saying this in a, a, from a critical standpoint, but Weber takes this as kind of a formula for what Germany has to do. Uh, so what you have to do is to foster a labor aristocracy. Um, so a middle strata, you should not, if, if, you put, if every rural worker bec becomes a proletarian in the countryside, you'll very quickly um, have the social democrats agitating there and you have a revolution in Germany. So what you have to do is to somehow have a, a middle class of workers that has more rights and will have a greater say in in politics, which again, all of this Weber is uh, going against the grain of the conservatives and liberals of his age. But the condition to that is that you have imperialist expansion that would guarantee um the the surplus uh the wealth that to finance uh that higher standing class of workers and so it wasn't lenin but weber found the concept of labor aristocracy even before lenin um and he found that re reading angles and so it's this kind of interesting element in this relationship that i think makes it uh more interesting than the old um contrast between them as uh, two thinkers in an abstract vacuum uh, there's other interesting stuff like that in the book, um, which uh, you see here. And um, and yeah, so uh, I guess I, I'm going to leave it there um, and move on to our panel. But thanks, thanks for being here, everyone, and thanks for for listening. Wonderful, Victor, and congratulations on this brilliant book. Uh, which I totally enjoyed. But we're going to start with our first commentator, Sarah Ferris. So go ahead. You have about 10 or 15 minutes. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, 
first of all, uh, I really want to thank Victor for writing this very important book because it really sheds new light uh, on the work and the political trajectory of Max Weber in ways that really uh, it had not done, it had not been done before. And perhaps even more importantly, I think I want to thank Victor for undertaking this work, which uh, has clearly been massive. If you just have a look at the book, it's clear that uh, it took many years. So it's uh, incredibly philologically, theoretically, historically rigorous. So I also want to thank him as uh, I think this book allows a new generation of Weber scholars uh, uh, of which uh, Victor is very much, uh, I, I think, a leading member to understand the undeniable impact of German social democracy and the German labor movement on Weber's work. I think too much of Weber's scholarship, uh, in my view, with uh, perhaps the exception of the work of uh, um, great scholars like Jan Rehmann or Sandro Mezzadra in Italy or Mommsen and perhaps a few more. So really, I, I would say the majority of Weber scholars uh, have tended to neglect, or at least in the past tended to neglect uh, this influence, the influence of um, social democracy on Weber's work, as well as his engagement with the labor question. As a younger PhD student, when I was working on my own dissertation on Weber, I remember that uh, the relationship between Weber and Kautsky's work, for instance, uh, seemed to be, was presented to me as uh, being limited to the influence uh, of Kautsky's work on Christianity, on Weber's subsequent work uh, on religions and capitalism. And instead, uh, as Victor's book clearly outlines, uh, discussions on the rural labor question were central for both Weber and Kautsky. So Victor's work focuses especially on the young Weber, whose relationship with German social democracy is very much mediated by discussions on rural, uh, rural labor, as he very persuasively demonstrates. My own work personally on Weber was more conceptual than historical and uh, uh, focused more on the older Weber, specifically on his so-called uh, sociology of religion. So I agree with Weber, uh, for instance, that there is more continuity rather than discontinuity or a rupture between the young and the more mature Weber, um, as it was sometimes implied by some scholars that the younger Weber, as Victor addresses very well in, in, uh, in his book, uh, somehow changed the route and started to write and think about different things. And instead, I think uh, Victor is right to, to underline and, and stress the continuities. The role of workers' organizations and workers' conditions, particularly uh, what the role they could play in the transition to capitalism and modernization, which Weber so much desired, was definitely a constant preoccupation for his young as well as for his older self. Now, the question or um, one of the questions Victor asked us to address is uh, why leftists uh, should still engage with Weber critically today? This I think is a very, very important question. Uh, I think that if you had asked me this question 10 years ago, when I had just finished my book on Weber uh, and uh, I had spent many years revising my PhD, I would have probably answered that Marxists and leftists should bury Weber for good and be done with all the interpolation that we as Marxists had been subjected to by many Weberian scholars over the decades. Marxists as economic determinists, Marxists as unable to understand the individual motives of action and so on and so forth. Partly I would have answered this way due to exhaustion, as I think many of you know, after many years of engagement with somebody's work, and of writing a book. It's uh, really hard to talk about it uh, for some time at least. But I think that more importantly, I would have answered in this way because the Weber I discovered through the years of working on my PhD first and then on, on my book was a very different man and intellectual from the one I had been presented as a sociologist in Italy. The Weber I discovered was uh, uh, in many ways a harsh nationalist, in several instances, as Angela very compellingly uh, demonstrated, a racist, 
and often the scholar who most contributed to shape to uh, Euro-American sociology is deeply Eurocentric, or if you like, Westocentric. And this discovery for me was very surprising and also very disturbing. Now, 10 years later, I am very glad that Victor uh, asked me this question because I think I am going to ask, uh, sorry, I am going to answer differently. So first, uh, um, I think that the impact of Weber's work on so much leftist intellectuals uh, uh, in the after World War II period uh, or from, the World War, from World War II onwards uh, uh, is in fact so widespread and intense that it is uh, simply impossible to neglect his work. For instance, uh, uh, Weber's concept of power, discipline, bureaucracy was very important for the Frankfurt School, uh, was very, very important for Foucault, theorization on the disciplinary society, and the latter concept in turn is very important, I think, also for an appreciation of Marx's own understanding of the role of discipline uh, in capitalism, or what, for instance, Soren Mao in a, in a recent book calls the economic power of capital. Secondly, I think Weber had, had a huge impact on Italian autonomous Marxist and so-called workerism from Panzieri to, to Tronti. So according to the latter, for instance, Weber could provide a theory of the state as a machine, as a special type of machine, where Marx and many Marxists, even Lenin, in, in many ways had failed. I don't personally agree on this with Tronti, and I have written a long article on this topic, but I, I have to say that Weber's work on bureaucracy, the capitalist state, and the functioning of power is indeed very fascinating and in many instances persuasive. Third, and also the final point I want to make, I think it is extremely useful to engage with the work of Weber because I think it helps us understand the epistemological and theoretical revolution represented by Marxist thought even more. So for instance, and here I, I, I want to refer to my own work and research interests of the last decade in particular, Marx is fundamental to address the relationship between gender, racial and class oppression and exploitation in ways that I think are truly transformative. And in ways that on the other hand, I think it is not fully possible to do with Weber. So let me try to be a little bit clearer. So Weber in many ways, I think he expressed and massively influenced a certain dominant paradigm within the social sciences that tended to depict the social world as one divided into spheres, the economic, the political, the social, and, and, and so forth. So while this distinction into spheres in some ways could still be seen even in some Marxist and intersectional feminists, I believe that Marx's notion of social relation and of integrated totality effectively overcomes this distinction and allows us to have a better grasp of the interrelation between different dimensions of oppression. Weber's notion of social action and his anthropological, or I would say in many ways anthropological, understanding of different cultures as based upon different types of personality. Uh, for instance, I'm not going to, um, to speak too much about this, but I have written, um, as was mentioned initially, a book on Weber's theory of personality, which uh, in a nutshell um, claims that in Weber's sociology of religion, Weber's sociology of religion is designed to uh, or theorizes the, the presence of different types of personalities in different countries. And uh, in uh, this way of addressing differences between countries, with, between uh, historical periods uh, in different regions of the world uh, makes it difficult to address uh, uh, racism, for instance, as an institutional and systemic social relation. And in many ways contributed to spread a certain idea of cultures as a separate and hierarchical civilizations. So really to conclude, I would say that engaging with Weber, given his uh, uh, importance to this very day in the social sciences uh, is uh, really crucial because I think it enables a conversation 
not only on, on Weber and Marx, but really on the foundations and the key categories of social theory more generally. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, excellent. Uh, before we go to Q&A and uh, some more words from Victor, let's hear from Angela Zimmerman. Thank you so much. It's such a treat to be part of this panel. I, Victor, engaging with, I've read the dissertation and I've read at least one version of the book manuscript along the way. And then reading the final version was just, it was, everyone was wonderful and each one more wonderful than, than the other. And it's just really been a pleasure to engage with that. And then to follow on your remarks, Sarah, too, that was just, those were wonderful too. And I, I think there'll be a lot of uh, resonance between what we were saying also. Um, I gave a title to my remarks um, and it's, there it's Marx and Weber, friends with benefits, question mark. And for those of you who are not English, we don't know the, the, the image. Friends with benefits is um, is sort of slang for people who are friends, but they also have sex sometimes too. And, and that's one aspect of what I want to talk about is, is, is sex in the broadest terms in Victor's account of Weber and in Weber and, and, and Marx. But then also to return to the question that, um, that Victor asks so well in the book and gives such an answer that I agree with so much, um, partly because it's it's a generative question as much as a definitive answer is, what are the benefits of thinking about Marx and Weber in dialogue with each other and as, and as, and as, um, as friends? So let me begin. I love how Victor frames what he calls the age old Marx slash Weber problem, because um, it is an old one. And I agree, I think with Victor's implication that it's been framed in a slightly boring way. Um, Weber is a kind of supplement to the Marx filling in the cracks, um, at least from the perspective of Marxists, or at least in US academia, and I think it's maybe a joke you can't even make in German academia, but as kind of a cover for Marx. So there's a joke about what do you call an untenured Marxist professor? And the answer to the joke is a Weberian. And I think, you know, I think post-tenured Marxist professors in Germany have to call themselves Weberians too. I'm not sure about that. Um, as Victor shows, and I agree, um, nation, race, and imperialism separate Weber and Marxism in the Marxist tradition. But like all dividing lines, what separates them is what they something they share too, or a question that they share too. Um, I was thrilled and flattered by the engagement uh, in parts of Victor's Victor's book, um, the ones that ones that stood out to me for understandable reasons by Victor's engagement with parts of Alabama in Africa and my interpretation of Weber there. And I totally loved how Victor, what Victor did with them. And I want to also engage with them in a, in a kind of comradely way by just emphasizing one part of my analysis that Victor didn't emphasize, not because I think, you know, you missed a part because it's, it's not about Alabama and Africa. And it's clear, this is one small part of Victor's work, but just as some way for me to contribute and to start a dialogue. And that part is sex, sex as as genders, sex as, you know, sex, sex, the benefits of friends with benefits, sex, especially as kinship, sex as reproduction, reproduction of race, nation, and class. It's the sex as it functions in sort of unconsciously in like people like Levi Strauss, Lacan, Gail Rubin, Monique Wittig, Joan Kopchak, and, and many others. Um, so I want to start as Victor starts the book with this wonderful image of the the wet nurse Weber's wet nurse, um, and it's so interesting that Mariana says that it was because Weber's mother couldn't produce milk because of course it would have been lots of reasons for people of that class to have someone else nurse their child, um, and for Mariana it's a metaphor for the source of Weber's views. Victor much more persuasively uh, makes it a metaphor for. I love this quote, the conflictive, asymmetrical, yet somehow intimate relationship um, between the working class and the liberal bourgeoisie and the Weber-Marxism relationship more broadly. And like all good metaphors, it exceeds the use, uh, its author's use of it. And it also functions in really interesting ways if one takes it more literally than it was actually deployed. I just Completely coincidentally, I happened to be for a class I was teaching, reading a section on the selection of wet nurses from Isabella Beaton's uh, Book of Household Management from 1861, which a little early, wrong country, but gives a sense th in the sense of like how a bourgeois woman like Faber's mother might have um, 
gone about selecting a wet nurse and what kind of things the wet nurse would be subjected to. Um, and the book describes how um, the physical examination of the wet nurse through looks at skin tone, um, an examination uh, of the breasts and the nipples of the candidate for wet nurse that is just chilling to read from when one thinks about the perspective of the wet nurse and resonates really and reminded me of the kind of racial examination um, of white people that Weber would have understood too, of sort of examining the physical characteristics for degeneration and so forth, and to try to select good members of a working class rather than, than bad members of the working class. It raises also the question of the household as a place of sex and intimacy, as well as abuse, patriarchy, and exploitation. And I couldn't help thinking, I was wondering um, if Sarah was going to do that in her comments to, to bring her excellent analysis of femonationalism and the way that kind of racialized domestic labor, precisely like Weber's wet nurse, um, functioned in the construction of the kind of nationalism um, and incorporation of women into the kind of nationalism that Weber himself was such a proponent proponent of. Um, so Weber on race, that's a part, that's the part that I've engaged with the most. Um, and I'm, and Victor's book is so important. And I just, and mostly I just feel like I'm being gaslit when I read texts on Weber because it's like, it's like as if it wasn't an issue race at all. And it's so clearly an issue for, for Weber. And Victor does such a wonderful job on it. And I, I really love how Victor, um, you know, the key point for, for Victor is this idea of a, of a hierarchical notion of culture and the ways in which, which I agree very much that it doesn't really matter that much whether something is biological or cultural. Although for people who are really invested in whether like Weber was a good guy or a bad guy, which I'm certainly not, I don't think Victor is either. Um, there's a question of like, is biology, if it's not biology, and if it's not immutable biological characteristics, then it's not racist. But of course, as Victor points out, and I completely agree with this, that it's the very malleability of race. It's biological, but not, you know, permanent immutable, that makes it political that makes it an object of concern for people like, for racists like Weber, um, and a worthwhile of intervention too. If it was just unchangeable, then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be political. So therefore German workers can be corrupted, um, polls can be elevated, there can be questions of racial mixing or miscegenation or amalgamation as they called it in the US earlier. Um, and I love, really grateful that Victor engaged with and built on my idea of, of um, race as hallucinatory, as a political economy of cultural difference. And there's a second aspect that I wanted to bring in. And again, mostly in my defense, because I, I, I would dislike a scholar who did such a thing, not to say you forgot an aspect because it's not about Alabama and Africa, but there's another aspect that I thought would be interesting to bring into that, which is it's not just, in my view, it's not, race isn't just imaginary, but it's also a kinship system as much as any other kinship system. It's about um, assigning age and gender roles, regulating sexual behavior, um, and compelling reproductive and often patriarchal heterosexuality. And I think all of those categories are really central to implicitly central, I think, or could be central even more to Victor's account, and are definitely central to both Engels and, and Weber. Um, in the in that just like mind blowing wonderful concluding part of the book where where Victor really shows this real dialogue between um, Engels and 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 Weber on these issues so bringing this bringing the the, um, the sex in um, the way both like just the historical fact I think of, of Weber's close reading of of Engels but also what Victor does with it in interpreting Weber and interpreting Engels is really amazing and particularly about the issues I mean v Victor talked about it in his in his remarks too um on imperialism and labor aristocracy um and the way in a sense Weber is endorsing precisely what Engels is bemoaning and I was thinking um it made me think of that passage from Mao's 1927 report on an investigation of the peasant movement in Hunan that's so important in, in Ranajit Guha's uh, account of subaltern studies, where Mao says, and then Ranajit Guha is going to problematize it, and we'll talk about it later, but that basically, if you want to know like how do peasants think about things, you can look at what landlords say, and whatever the, pe the landlord says is fine, the peasant says is terrible, whatever the peasant says is fine, the landlord says is terrible. And in a way, it's sort of like Engels is fine, is Weber's terrible, and vice versa. And that's a lot of the, the relationship. And it 
it works really well and it is a kind of an interesting relationship. Um, and why, I mean, and it's so clear to me that there's such an opening for talking about sex and all the words of, and all the meanings of that, gender, household, kinship, patriarchy, and the production of, of race in this, um, in Weber's reading of Engels. And I want to read a passage from Victor's, it's kind of confusing to read it out loud because it's like me quoting Victor in parts quoting Angles. So I'll go like this when Victor's quoting Angles. And this whole part is a quote from Victor. It's on page 282 to 83, if people want to follow along at home. So in, this is Victor. In his readings of Angles, Weber picks up, especially in those passages, where the interaction of culture, labor, in the interaction of culture, labor, and political consciousness are approached. He, Weber, comments, for instance, on how the conversion of women to the, quote, economic back, the conversion of women to the, quote, economic backbone of the family, coupled with child labor and the general, um, I missed a word, of worker's existence, leads to a loss of forward-looking consideration for offspring and to the, quote, destruction of paternal authority in the household. And for Weber, as Victor points out, this creates a Russian difference, a racial difference within the German working class in the, between the working class, work, labor aristocracy and the, the proletariat. And I mean, the relation of the, the origin of the word proletariat in ancient Roman concepts about people who can only breed. I mean, that's some, we won't talk about it now, but that's interesting. That would be interesting here too. Um, so for social democratic feminism, like Babel's um, Women in Socialism, but also just like women who went into social became Marxists, a lot of, you know, at least some of them in the 19th century. Um, this was the capitalist foundation of communist liberation from patriarchy. This is the, it's precisely this, um, women going into the factory that's not, you know, it's it's terrible, but it's not to be bemoaned, but it's a seed for, for liberation. Um, and it's very much like the fine, terrible distinction where precise, in a sense, Weber and Engels can agree on everything. And what Weber says is, fine, or is terrible rather, Engels is fine and, and vice versa. But it's precisely this, what the proletarianization does to gender and sexuality, um, and particularly to kind of this heteropatriarchal gender and sexuality and to race and so forth. Um, so to return to the benefits of this, this friendship in the original sense, um, why should Marxists read Weber? Um, I was like Sarah for a long time too, and Victor changed my mind. For a while, I would say grudgingly, I mean, we should read all these horrible people just to understand how, that's how the bourgeoisie thinks and like, whatever, glad it's not us. But it's obviously Victor shows as much more than, than that. Also just because Weber's reading angles too, and we know Marxists have read Weber for, you know, subsequently for a long time too. Um, And Victor shows how Weber, unlike so many liberals, were willing to name the structures of class rule um, from Marx's criticisms and then use them just kind of by like reversing them. And Victor called this dialogue fruitful on page 304. And at first in my like, just like, oh, metaphor, sexuality. I'm like, you know, I wanted to read this image of sexual reproduction of fruitfulness, like the wet nurse image, fruitful, yes, but also fraught by power and violence, like the milk that baby Weber drank from social democratic breasts, fruitful for whom? Um, Weber was smart enough to learn from his enemies to attack them where, they're they are, where they fought in the patriarchal household as much as the factory and the farm. But of course, then I thought, well, Engels' labor concept of labor aristocracy and imperialism also comes from the ideology of labor aristocrats and imperialists themselves. So they're both reading each other. And it is a lot like this back and forth of Mao's fine, terrible distinction. And then I was thinking, so in Prose of Counterinsurgency, when Ranaji Guha does this terrible, fine thing, um, in elementary aspects of peasant insurgency, he says that's as he's following Mao there. But in Prose of Counterinsurgency, published the same year, I forget which year, um, Guha says that fine, terrible reversal is not enough. There's something else. And for Guha, that thing is unnameable in academic history. And that's the whole subaltern studies, um, you know, venture. Um, but I think of like, what's the unnameable? And that's like in Lacanian feminism of like Kopchak or Zupancic, it's sex that's the unnameable. I think in Marx, communism is the unnameable, the riddle of history solved, the kind of asymptotic quote, end of history that's not really history. Or for Engels more, the person who was most interested in, in sex of the Marx and Engels, um, 
it was the sexual morality of the future that we can't know in the present. And we are, in fact, absurd to even try to imagine what we would look like in the present. So against the old count of Marx and Weber's friends, um, Victor's uh, book makes me think they're, you know, to use two other, like kind of another coy metaphor, more than friends or friends with benefits in some ways. But then with all the question of power and inequality that that might imply. Um, and so then the question is, what are these benefits and how can we think about them? And Victor, you've given us so much rich material to think about, not just material, that sounds, but so much, so many ways to think about it and made me really excited about this, this topic. Um, and it's such an exciting book. So thank you very much for doing that and for letting me comment on it. That's awesome. Thank you, Angela. All right, so we have uh, quite a lot of uh, great things to talk about. Please do post uh, questions and I will see them here um, on my screen when they're posted. Uh, Victor, I don't know if you can see the chat box, but there's quite a lot of compliments. They're wonderful. Um, no comments yet. So I'm gonna give you, uh, Victor, a chance to maybe pick up on any themes that uh, we've heard from our two panelists if you want. Sure, and thanks so much for these uh, these incredible interventions. Uh, so starting from the end, starting uh, with Angela, I guess you kind of uncovered my main uh, guilt. So if you want to go into some psychoanalysis um, and the repression of sex in the in in the manuscript, basically I gathered a lot of material of Weber on the so-called women's question, which is also uh, you know emerging at this period in the end of the 19th century. You have a lot of um, female social democratic activists who are um, struggling for for women's rights and uh, gender equality, um, and not only in Germany. You know, and they're um, forming an international movement. You have um, a figure like Clara Zetkin, and you, this, this is also in the air. And people at the time very much connected social democracy, not only with the subversion of social order, but also with the subversion of the family, right? And so it was impossible for someone to engage with uh, social democracy without taking this into account. And that's not different from Weber, but there's a there's a detail there. It's also very interesting how in his family, um, there's a conflict in his family. Uh, his mother is basically uh, more socially engaged, more conservative, but more socially engaged than the father. The father is a, very patriarchal, gives her no freedom, uh, and Weber takes her side. And some of the arguments he uses are very similar to what he would say about the workers, that you have to take their, you have to take her standpoint into account as a right, it's not a concession, etc. So he's he's in the same kind of position as kind of an enlightened liberal with issues un underneath the surface, but that compared to the conservatives of his time is, uh, you know, fairly progressive for the time, but, uh, you know, we have to kind of look closer at what is the basis of those views. Um, and there's some remarks about like the one you quoted where, uh, the the fact that the proletarian family kind of dissolves uh, the nuclear family that he doesn't think that's such a great idea. What I discovered, and this I'm going to make this into an essay. Uh, you know, for everyone that's listening, this is a PhD, and then, you know, like Sarah said, I definitely was going into this exhaustion period, so I kind of, uh, have, you know, got was distant from it from for a little while. Then it started getting too long, and then you want to change everything. Um, and one thing. Of course, my engagement with uh, the history of feminism and also this is also a question of my own education in this in these issues uh, and, and with gender and history, etc. was becoming more central. And what I what I found out is that uh, there is a mention of the of Babel's book in a letter from Weber to Mariana Weber. So just as he gets to know her uh, and they get married in 1893. So Weber is maybe 29. She's a little younger. Um, he and they're kind of in this courtship thing, uh, and he actually sends her Babel's uh, "The Women in Socialism," which is the social democratic bestseller of the time, by the way, of all uh, of any topic. And he sends this to her and says something to the tune like, "Let's read, let's take a look at this together," and which I find very interesting right before their their marriage. And but there is a bizarre silence on gender and on the patriarchy in Weber's work, including the later Weber, for someone who has such an intricate theory of domination, uh, which like Sarah put it, is very compelling and 
very uh, um, convincing, intoxicating even. Uh, definitely Foucault, uh, if you guys read Weber, you'll, you'll see the source of a lot of things there. But there is no, in, in um, traditional, uh, in traditional domination, in, in uh, the three forms of legitimate, 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 oh, sorry, legitimate domination, uh, one of them is traditional. The patriarch is not in there. He doesn't deal with gender. Gender doesn't appear in his uh, sociology of domination. How? Because just like Marx and Engels, in a way, had a division of labor uh, in, and, you know, Engels wrote on war and on science topics and a bit more on gender, uh, perhaps. Uh, Weber, Max, and Mariana had a very similar division of labor. And so he kind of left gender to her. So gender is your thing, um, which again, we can, uh, we can think about that. Uh, there, there are issues with that delegation. But turns out that uh, Mariana Weber in 1908 uh, or nine published a, a book that, that's a fully fledged response to, to Babel's book and to Engels. And basically it's called uh, Ehefrau und Mutter in der Rechtsentwicklung. So, uh, wife and mother in the development of law. This hasn't been really translated. There are only pieces of it. And there you really see how it's a perfect, uh, she kinds of, she, she takes a Weberian perspective or uh, into precisely um, the marriage and power relations in the domestic sphere and tries to provide an answer to the social Democrats into their questioning of the family and uh, fight for a more gender equality in a very similar way from a very similar position that Weber's re responds in the, uh, with regards to the labor question. And so this is something I wanted to include, but couldn't uh, at least a mention to, and so what was repressed is now uh, coming to light, uh, thanks to your intervention, Angela, but this is something that's crucial. And my position on this now is that you cannot just read Max Weber. You have to read Max and Mariana together. They had a, a really, they, they had an intellectual partnership that is at least akin to Marx and Engels uh, in the sense that they're not the same. It's not that one is the, you know, you have to read them both. And especially because they wrote about certain different topics um, or they, they kind of distributed stuff amongst them. And so that that should have definitely been in and it's frustrated me that i couldn't or at least this was the thing that i was forced to say okay if i go into that i'm not going to finish this um i i revised the book during the the pandemic um and yeah i wanted to get on to to research on on uh, communist feminists which is what i work on now uh maybe as also a, an answer to this repression um but but thanks so much for uh, for highlighting this and with regard, just one point with what Sarah said with the autonomous, I find it very fascinating that uh, you you have a lot of anarchist readings of his sociology of domination. Um, this is one of the strands of readings of his work. Um, in exactly one of the gaps is not just the economic, uh, so-called gaps in Marxism, economic deter uh, determinism, but the supposed inability to deal with the political sphere, right? And you know, we don't have to go uh, as far as the autonomous did, um, but I, I like to have Weber as kind of the little little devil on my shoulder uh, in the sense of he's constantly giving you um, a, an alternative way of seeing things that, however, doesn't overcome the, um, the status quo. Uh, he has a critique of the status quo, but he doesn't have an alternative project to it. This is how I end the book. Uh, and... I say how this is really central that there, there is no alternative to capitalism in Weber's view, but he can still be critical of capitalism. And so he offers an alternative and he, he's kind of like a cartographer of the possible. Uh, he's not so much a realist, but Weber is the, as a legal scholar, he drew the categories and the forms of our daily lives under capitalism uh, particularly well, not everything. Some issue, there are some issues in his in his thought, but the fascination comes from how logically coherent that all is, and how much equivalence you fa you find. And so he's a, but he's also like a provocateur. He he loves to compare the left. Uh, there is no critique of religion in Weber's work. Uh, he doesn't speak about you know Weber. No, a lot of theology never speaks about Feuerbach. So in a way, where Marxism begins. Uh, Feuerbach's critique of Hegel, 
uh, that's where Weber stops. The moment where the historical view on religion that is emerging in Germany uh, becomes the critique of religion and critique of alienation. You do not have that in Weber. Um, but, and so Weber is exactly um, this, the fact that he draws the line there uh, is, has, has a structural effect in his whole uh, way of thinking. And this is, again, another way of understanding this, this uh, friendship with benefits. He's always uh, saying, you cannot go beyond this. These forms, we cannot get rid of them, the state, the family, um, this, this form of social uh, organization. Maybe you can overcome capitalism, you have something worse. These, uh, these are somehow intrinsic, uh, even if he constructs them as, as ideal types. And so this is, this is uh, my relationship, uh, my open relationship uh, with Weber, uh, perhaps. And, but again, thanks so much. I, I also want to, you know, this is a, a PhD or a book is always like a collective product. And so reading Angela's work and Sarah's and Tom's, um, Manuela Boatka's was essential. Also, my advisor want to thank Jan Riemann, who has a, a wonderful book in the HM book series which is a Gramscian reading of Weber that you shouldn't miss and is, goes and would pair very well uh, with this reading too. Thank you, Victor. Lots, uh, lots there. Um, we do have a question <clears throat> in, uh, we do have a question from Pip Rossi, which I think all of us might have a perspective on, um, right? I wonder what the panel thinks about the usefulness of focusing on certain individual thinkers. Can this take away from the ideas themselves. I mean, since we all do that, well, we probably all have something to say about that. Yeah, does anyone want to start? <laughs> People have heard me enough. I might start by saying yeah. that um, just, just that one of the great virtues of Victor's book is that uh, you learn a lot of social history here, social and economic history. It's really steeped in social and economic history. And so the, the Weber material, and it is almost completely new Weber material, even for those of us who have spent our entire careers reading Weber, because it's only been published in German, uh, the material that he focuses on in the last uh, decade or so, some of it just in the last few years. So that's why Victor really does need to be congratulated for working with this in the German and translating it and interpreting it. But what he does is he puts that against not just the intellectual currents of the late 19th century and not just uh, the intellectual currents in Europe and Germany in particular, but he puts it in a global historical perspective with the rise of, of imperialism, colonialism and globalization. So it is more than just a kind of an intellectual history. It also um, it also tells us something about uh, uh, a part of a crucial uh, pivot of history, um, uh, not just in, in Europe, but also as expressed through um, the, these, uh, these blind spots and brilliant insights of this particular thinker, Max Weber. That's how I would address that question. Can I say something about this? Because I think that with thinkers such as Weber, and not just Weber, but many others, um, in some ways we do the opposite, or at least we are exposed to the opposite in the sense that we focus on the ideas rather than on the thinker. And uh, I say that in the sense that, um, as I uh, mentioned earlier when I, when I, when I intervened, I read Weber, I read Weber's ideas, I read his methodological writings, his work on religion and, and so on and so forth. And so his ideas, you know, they were always there. But uh, one thing that I think many students, uh, students of sociology, students of Weber, really didn't do and perhaps still uh, many students in general in social theory and the social sciences don't do, is to read those ideas in context. So to read the ideas alongside the thinker, who was this thinker? Uh, where does he come from? What is his biography? How is his biography relevant uh, in order to understand also his ideas? And I think that the, the merit of uh, Victor's work is precisely that, that we can read those ideas that in some ways we are familiar with uh, alongside the thinker and uh, his history. 
Thank you. Uh, Angela? I just wanted to say I completely agree with um, what Sarah said and with, with what you said, Tom. And I think in some ways there is, an, and including that what Victor, your characterization of Victor's project too, is this incredibly historically rich and con not just contextualized sounds like it's about Weber and then there's some context and it's like, I don't know what the right word is. There's probably some like Derridian, like, you know, like the, the, the supplementary text of social history and the text of Weber together. Um, and that is so important. And I think it's, it's not just, I mean, partly, you know, and it's not just to be distinguished from just social history, um, whatever that would be, but also from a kind of rarefied intellectual history that looks only at the ideas and abstracts them and doesn't look at or dismisses context. Um, or sometimes we'll say, I mean, this has been, you know, nobody here, but like sometimes when Weber scholars want to say Weber's racism doesn't matter, they'll say something like, well, I mean, Weber was a man of his time. I mean, first of all, as if like Polish people who were Weber's contemporaries had the same anti-Polish views that Weber did, like obviously not. So it doesn't even make sense like logically at all, but using context as a way to just like dismiss aspects of the ideas that aren't important, but rather it's sort of like Weber as a um, as a, an embodiment of the time, but also there's some line that I'm not gonna get, it's like, it's like, Lucian Goldman, me misquoting Lucian Goldman, misquoting um, angles on like representative versus typical. But there's something about like a thinker who like embodies the contradictions of their times, not because I think they're such geniuses, but because they just do. And so you read Weber, and when you read Weber, you see like this kind of like it's like the world we live in, I think, too, but it's also Weber's world. And so there's this very dialectical relationship between the two that I think Victor is a great example of that kind of that kind of that kind of work. So I see it. You're here. You want to touch thanks. on that, yeah. Victor? Yeah, thanks so much for these comments. Uh, and I love how Pip Rosie is like peppering these uh, great comments in our chat, uh, which I uh, all, you know, yeah, let's definitely uh, meld anarchism and Marxism. That my remark about that is maybe Weber is not the, the conduit to do that. Maybe there are better, there are better suppliers. I don't know. Kropotkin and, uh, and and many others. But I start the book with a quote from Heine, uh, my hero again. And the quote is exactly goes in this sense of not overly individualizing in a, in a, in a narrow sense. So the, the quote is the hero of my book, it's true hero is the social movement. And so the whole idea is that social science didn't simply emerge from the head of Weber. Um, it, it's a, it's the product of this conflicting um, reality and basically of the questions that it raised and that Weber from his particular position in that reality had to, to respond in somehow. And he's one uh, of those who tried to respond and, and was adept at, uh, you know, uh, formulating a system and producing theory. But the protagonist of the book is our the social democrats are the working class uh it's it's a very it's workerist in that sense um and and so i totally agree with that with with that and so the biographical elements that i bring in i try not to make overly individualistic in the weber literature there's an obsession with the biographical elements of his trajectory that doesn't help and that's interesting because uh, it's very focused on sex, but not in the way that unlocks uh, elements of his work and that permeates it that Angela uh, raised uh, in such a such a brilliant fashion, but is more focused on like unlocking him as a as a troubled individual and intellectual, a very male thing of, you know, his greatness came uh from somehow he's unrealized sexual fantasies and stuff like that uh but in a very conservative key and in a way in the literature uh, Mar mariana weber is ignored uh because she uh burned some of the letters that weber and Karl Jaspers, the you know later uh phenomenologist uh philosopher they Weber saw Jaspers for a while when he, he had a massive bout of depression in uh, right after the, the period that I treat here. And this is very well known. Uh, it, it's tough to diagnose these things. You know, maybe it was bipolar. There's a lot of speculation on that. And these letters where he talks about sex and uh, it's 
it's reputed to be the key that we miss and that would unlock all of Weber. And uh, Mariana having burned it is as the, is seen as the ultimate sin. And you know, and she's still attacked uh, as and she remains, in my opinion, uh, the best biographer, even if she was very close and had a lot of blind spots and someone who we should be reading, uh, like I said before. So very, uh, totally agree. Depending on this narrow focus, uh, we won't understand anything uh, of his work where this won't bring anything. And that's that definitely not what the book uh, is trying to do. Thank you. <clears throat> we do have another question, and, and I would I would again invite uh, people to actually really do read this book because one of the great moves Victor makes is to decenter some of that over individualizing and by bi bi biographical material while still drawing on it. So it it makes it uh, it makes a much more much more powerful argument to to approach the biographical material that way. So Kanishka writes um, about some of the post-Weberian uh, uh, um, Marxist uh, trends. Could you say something about the relationship between Weber and Lukács? Um, we know that they did influence them. So how exactly did Be uh, Weber influence Lukács and maybe what the implications of that are for Western Marxism? Yeah, uh, that's a fascinating one and uh, goes back to our uh, recurrent theme of sex. Um, the there's Ve Lukács was Weber's student, right? He he goes to Heidelberg in his pre-Marxist phase um, in the late in the early 1910s. And because for different reasons, he can't uh, he's unable to uh, get a, a, an academic career going in in this pre-war World War One Germany and the, the war makes things more complicated. One of the things is the fact that uh, uh, Lukács is Jewish. Uh, the other that he's a radical thinker at this point, uh, but not yet even if not yet a Marxist. And there's a fascinating uh, correspondence between them where they are discussing the different forms of life and and how uh, Weber is trying to uh, you know kind of. Uh, give suggestions to Lukács of where he should go next with his work. And he's talking about how the forms of life behind them, there is the erotic. He comes to this final conclusion. Uh, so that's one moment where Weber touches on this and and which should be exploited. Uh, it's fascinating, just to give an example, and hey, Kanishka, it's great that, that you're uh, uh, watching this. Uh, it's, a, it's a great example of uh, Lukács in history and class consciousness, in, in, that's my reading of it. Is in, in it's not so much that he is has a Weberian Marxism, but he the questions that Weber raises and answers with binaries, right? Um, so um, his concept of domination very very much a binary, uh, even if there's some dynamic. Uh, in that power is very top down in Weber's uh, view, even though he sees power in every relationship, uh, it's it does congeal around the state. Weber does not think of politics without the state is basically unthinkable for Weber. Um, a society without classes is for him a fantasy. All these elements, uh, what Weber raises as a question and answers with a binary, uh, Lukács will try to give a dialectic response to. And so he takes Weber's questions and reframes them. He tries to give an alternative account of how uh, of why you have these spheres that does not, however, um, accept that they're you know discrete entities that do not interact. Uh, you know the totality is a direct answer to that. But in this moment in Weber's work, there's a point. There's a moment in history and class consciousness where uh, Lukács. Uh, quotes Weber because Weber says basically a bureaucrat is basically an, admi an administrative proletarian, right? He does not has, have the means of administration. And this is a way that the Weber kind of like a virus or he, he kind of uh, infects Marxism and then destroys it from within. He takes a category and expands it, but in expanding it, he makes it no longer function or he makes it into something else. And that's a valid thing, but uh, you can't just, the bureaucrat is not uh, the same as a proletarian. There are, there are issues. Uh, this position in society is different for many ways, but you could talk about a proletarization as a general social phenomena. And you still have elements of that in Lukács still kind of quotes that more or less directly to talk about how 
um, reification is um, spreading the the commodity form in in capitalist uh, society. Um, but that's where this is the kind of stuff that Lukacs will try to build um, an actual theory of bureaucracy from the ground up, or at least of a critique of bureaucracy from the ground up. Again, rather answering the question raised by Weber than simply uh, trying like a fusion or, or or like a you know two species of plant where you you kind of meld them together. Um, but I could go on about this uh, this this topic. Um, but there there's a there's a question to Sarah, I, I think. Um, it's a question that's drawn draws from Sarah's uh, uh -huh. comment earlier. Um, uh, and I think it is, does tie to the to the Lukács question because Lukács is very much a Marxist thinker in the sense of thinking of alternatives, whereas Weber, as you put it, uh, Victor in the epilogue, he he has a kind of political anthropology of the absent alternative. He's the theorist of no alternatives, right? Uh, kind of a Thatcherite in that sense. Um, well, Paul Paul wants to put that in a more focused way. He says one contextual features feature of the book is the sense in which the patriarch of modern sociology, uh, Weber, was so focused on the rural pre-modern context in some of the work that you illuminate in the book. Does that help to explain Weber's thinking about how no alternative to capitalism and the patriarchal and racial themes? Question to you, Victor. That's a tough but if you one. want to pick up yeah. on it, it's a uh, it's interesting uh, that what I think is I, I could say is that what what's fascinating is how for for Weber the divide is between the the pre and the capitalist the traditional and the capitalist. So he uses the word modern, but uh, it's not so much modernity versus uh, pre modernity. That's the Weber's readers in the post war period. Um, that's why Weber's key concept is rationalization, not modernization. Uh, this is important, right? What was made of Weber in the post-war period. Um, and so what I find fascinating is that that's to him the binary uh, and what that prevents him from seeing, uh, what that obfuscates is that he's dealing with a specific form of capitalism that has already uh, been in development for two centuries, for centuries, and where imperialism is has become entirely central. And so it allows, uh, because Weber draws the line between traditional and modern or between um, traditional societies and capitalist ones, he, he, can, uh, in, he can insert elements of colonialism and imperialism as traits of capitalism uh, without recognizing the impact of uh, colonialism and imperialism for the rise of capitalism. So by making the binary, by putting it as in, in these terms in his work, he elides a division within uh, a development of cap within capitalism itself, or it allows him to, um, to, to silence the elements that are not purely capitalistic that have uh, contributed to the rise of capitalism. So, and I guess for, for the patriarchy, you could make a, a similar argument that that's why it's not it's not there. Um, I don't know if that helps. Uh, Sarah, is there a way in on that question? So, okay, um, I'm going to ask. Sarah or, or Angela, if you'd like to ask a question, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question of my own if I can, Victor. Um, <clears throat> I think I think one of the uh, the really uh, surprising arguments you make in the second part of the book is uh, regarding these two the the comparison of these two empirical uh, research projects on rural agrarian labor, and in particular, you see you, you see um, Weber's. Uh, um, participation in that study in those in those two questionnaires as um, really the birthplace of Weberian theory. What we know we know about it as a focus on the ethical ideal drivers of modern of economic conduct. Um, but and and Weber's innovation or or his uh, his his you could even call it his bias. I think is that he sees the Protestant ministers 
administering this survey to rural laborers uh, um, uh, as, as somehow more valid, more close. But of course, he doesn't actually ask questions. He doesn't actually uh, um, develop a questionnaire for Catholic uh, ministers or Catholic priests um, for some of the same areas or, or elsewhere in Germany. Um, could you just say a bit more about why you why in what sense you think that that's a significant finding from these from these old these materials from the young Weber, which we're only really only able to see now with in in their full uh, in their full full glory, and why that that there really is a that that helps you to identify a kind of uh, racial but also ethnic uh, uh, bias um, informing Weber's early work, but carried over into his later work. Sure, um, and this is kind of the meat of the work. Um, this, this, this was Weber's his report on. It's called the sit, uh, the situation of the rural workers in um, in East Albion, Germany, and his report. It, it's one of those things that uh, has set it's been published for a long time but you really have to dig into it to find uh, the interesting things and what it what it does it, it it's kind of Weber's laboratory he's becoming a social a thinker before your eyes if you reconstruct how he came into this research and uh, what he thought about it and how the different things he wrote about it uh, he, he worked on this for two three years and what I took is there is one questionnaire on the so-called labor question that is sent to landowners and he works with the responses to that he wrote a book about that while he's writing uh the the summary he while he's in the analyzing all these report all these reports on the labor question written by landowners he decides this is this standpoint is problematic and won't um uh won't shed light into this issue and into how what wor wor workers themselves things uh, obviously <laughs> enough so he comes up with a second research and it, they're great to, to compare because in one of them he then participated in elaborating it he just got the material after it was done and produced a report and then this other one he came up with a questionnaire alongside um a, a protestant uh, uh minister and he sent them out and didn't uh the analysis was done by his doctoral students so by what he added we understand exactly what he thought was wrong with that research and i also get the letters and see how his critique and basically weber wanted a greater greater insight into workers living conditions uh and but also workers men mentality and uh, their their budgets, what do they eat? Weber has this fixation on food in this moment as kind of an indicator of culture. There's a whole, I could also have written a whole chapter on that. It's like, depending on what you eat, that's also related to the level of culture. And, you know, going to that biological and cultural racism are, you know, the frontier is, is kind of, uh, um, you know, very fluid. But what, so what I found out is then that Basically, this is also not just how Weber was brilliant and wanted to take uh, workers' uh, standpoint into account. You have social democrats who are criticizing the, the first research by saying it doesn't take workers' standpoint into account enough. Uh, it's not providing an accurate um, portrayal of their lives. And so he's being pushed also from uh, social democrat critics to take the more, uh, workers themselves more into consideration. But he refuses to interview them directly. Weber is afraid that if you ask workers about their condition, that this will raise their class consciousness. He does, he says this very clearly. <laughs> um, and he has, he, he, he's, he's afraid that these questions will make them re more rebellious, that will create, uh, and so just raising the questions, this tells you a lot about Imperial Germany and how repressive it was that just raising the question of uh, what is your life like? What is, uh, you know, what are your working conditions? Uh, how much do you get to eat? And what is missing in your budget and stuff? And so he refuses to um, to interview workers. And then again, the book shows how that's through these different questionnaires, what he's looking for is exactly like the role of the, these ideals into um, workers, uh, yeah, decisions and even the political choices. But what I find out then in the end of the book is uh, is that Weber, for the second one, 
refuses to interview Catholic priests because he thought he would have a problem with it, with, uh, you know, ecclesiastical hierarchy, but also because he says, because I'm a Protestant professor, um, I can't uh, be engaged in a research on Catholics. And this I find fascinating because he had just taken part in a, in a research, his whole um, advancement is to, as a, as a member of the bourgeois classes, a class conscious member of the bourgeois classes, as he says, uh, he takes workers, some of them, uh, German high standing workers standpoint into account. So he can bridge that divide within an ethic and cultural uh, um, common ground. But he's, he, consider, he considers the fact of being a Protestant somehow a bias that he cannot overcome, similar to one that he will draw with uh, non-Western subjects, as uh, Sarah's book uh, will explore. So very similar. And so he decides just to, to stick to the Protestants. And so this tells you just how Weber uh, understands religion, just like uh, imperialism characterized the way he thought about culture and race, as in you have these discrete entities called nations that are basically ethnic racial unit, units, and uh, they interact with each other, and maybe you should recognize their differences and even study them and, and respect their diversity, but they're basically there, uh, and change, if, if it happens, takes on, uh, you know, centuries and, and things like that. He, he doesn't say we, we humanity can't all reach racial equality at some point, but he calls it a dream of uh, social democrats that we already inhabit a world where uh, racial equality is possible. This is, a, this is an actual quote. Um, and, but with religion, that's also, he, his view of religion is very much uh, shaped by an imperial Germany that politicized the, the divide between Catholics and Protestants and, uh, and where this uh, went very far and and basically creates a bias that is for him uh, impossible to overcome. So this will kind of inform his whole attempt to find objectivity in his later work is exactly him running into these biases that he feels uh, he, you can't overcome from a particular standpoint. Uh, the problem is, of course, that he doesn't challenge uh, these, these uh, entities that he uh, describes, right? So uh, that's part two going to part three of the book. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, pose a, a challenge to you, uh, Victor, which I'm sure you can take. It's from Charles. Um, he says, rationalization leads directly to um, understanding our problem today, climate change. And he doesn't, he that is Charles, doesn't see an answer to climate change, our future, in any of the thinkers we're discussing. I'm wondering if you could uh, just speak about a bit about that, Victor, specifically with, with respect. Yeah, that's a great point with rationalization. And it's not that it's not a concept that doesn't, um, you know, explain a lot of our reality, or at least a lot of what elements that uh, that capitalism brings into many spheres of life, Weber would say all of them, um, you know, the rationalization process together with secularization so it's exactly what's impelling us to what to it's what impelling every sphere to become uh separate and every uh profession dedicated to a certain sphere to become a more and more specialized craft right and to make all the elements within that particular sphere, be it work uh or I don't know I mean we could even within work from the how you organize a factory to uh, how administration is organized, but even even more prosaic things. Uh, I don't know how you cook food uh, from everything for Weber is being affected by this um, impulse towards rationalization that makes it single minded uh, and makes it highly specialized and makes it abstract from everything else. And so this would help understand climate change in the sense of abstracting from nature entirely um, in, let's say, uh, profit-making activities or, uh, sure, rationalization could uh, help with that. Vapor, by the way, mostly abstracts from nature. Nature is not, or uh, society, nature relations are mostly absent from his work. Uh, he has this one quote in the Protestant ethic that he says, this, this system 
will subsist until the last drop of fossil fuel is exhausted, which is this incredible prophecy. Um, and so you're right, but that's exactly where the problem with Weber lies because he doesn't see any other way to stop it except for us burning the fossil fuel. And now we know we can't burn it all because uh, that would uh, that would you know make social life impossible and uh, would lead to mass extinction, etc. Uh, the problem is a concept like rationalization because uh, Weber construes it in a way that it, it emerges from these uh, ascetic Protestants uh, through their work ethic and their relationship to the world because of uh, the structure of their belief. And I won't go into this. And then it detaches itself and finds in, um, in the mercantile economy a perfect partner and they feed into each other and it becomes then something that... Um, becomes pervasive in every sphere of life because he detaches them. So it's not the rise of capitalism that led to rationalization. It just drives it far, uh, you know, it just exponentiates it. You also have no way of um, critiquing it. That's not an irrational utopia where it's, just, it's not just breaking fully. Uh, you know, it's not irrationalism. It's not feelings or whatever. For Weber, any critique of rationalization is um, falling into some kind of uh, irrationalist, um, mystic uh, kind of critique, and you put most of the left in that uh, in that camp. He says, if if you still want to have the products of uh, rationalization, and you don't want the ills of this world, then what you have is a is a is a fantasy, is a utopia in the in the sense of uh, unrealizable. But that's the whole thing, uh, and that's why reification. To go back to Lukács is uh, a more interesting concept of how uh, how capitalism um, how or how the mode of production can influence the way uh, other uh, i'm going, going to say spheres here but uh, other elements of social life function even if they're not directly related to economic production or reproduction and so not to go into lukacs lukacs will try to uh, say or will try to argue how the commodity form also structures uh, the way that um, other yeah, forms of social life from the family to the state, uh, how, we, how they appear, how we uh, interact with them, uh, how we see them, how they, um, like, yeah, how they manifest themselves socially, right? So he says this fetishism becomes a universal phenomenon. But this also means that if you overcome capitalism, you can, uh, you, you can break with reification, um, possibly, or at least you can fight against it. Um, with Weber, because rationalization is this, pro this process that became uh, autonomous and merged with capitalism, but is not identical with it, there is really no answer. And I would definitely say that reification and other Marxist concepts, or at least Marxist uh, critique of political economy is essential uh, to address the question of uh, climate as catastrophe. And there's a lot of uh, some of the best literature, Marxist literature that's emerging is precisely in eco-socialist uh, perspective. Um, even if not all Marxists, uh, you know, took the question of nature and uh, the environment into their perspective, et cetera. But I don't think that's the issue right now. So that's, that's a great example of where Weber leads us. It's a critical point of view that could even work with, climate change, which he actually prophesizes, or not climate change, but climate disaster, but he gives us no way out. And if you give no way out, if, you're, if your uh, view of society uh, is a closed one, or view of social life is a closed one, this will have, this will, this will have problematic effects in how you structure that view of uh, social life. There'll be other issues with it, probably. That's just a sign that that, uh, of a conservative uh, uh, point of view on the world. Uh, Charles also uh, recommends uh, to everybody listening and to you, Victor, uh, Pierre Charbonnier's book, Affluence and Freedom, an Environmental History of Political Ideas. And in light of, uh, of, of alternative uh, social theories from uh, the 19th century, definitely read uh, John Bellamy Foster's Marxist Ecology and the things coming out of that. And I would also, uh, Victor and I also are 
are friends with uh, the editor of the Max Weber Gesamtausgabe, Ada Tanka, and she's published a really important and crucial essay, I think, that picks up on the whole of, uh, of Weber's either neglect of or uh, um, problematic engagement with questions of ecology and nature, and focusing on that one passage, that famous passage on the la burning of the last ton of fossil fuel as the only alternative, to, uh, the only way in which we'll uh, find a way out of, uh, or find an alternative to capitalism. Um, other questions? Uh, Payman notes that we can't really address climate change change without addressing the law of private property and value exchange, hence the need for um, a return to Marx and thinking where Weber uh, certainly found an impasse uh, in, 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 re in his reading of Marx, as I would say. Uh, Pip, I'll, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Angela. Well, I'm just, I'm thinking, just thinking about the, um, I mean, you clearly show the benefits that Weber got from reading Engels and reading Marxists um, and from being engaging with social Democrats. Can you say more about the, the benefits? And in some way, I mean, your book is an example of the benefits that, you know, Marxists or Marxists can gain from reading, reading Weber, but it's really a kind of a historical critical examination of Weber as much as, uh, you know, Taking Weber's con taking Weber's concepts and and in a sense mobilizing them for revolutionary purposes the way Weber the way Weber took Marx's concepts and revolution and adapted them or modified them for counter revolutionary purposes but can you say something I mean do you see a benefit of in a sense doing to Weber what Weber did to Marxists for Marxists or is that not the right relationship to think about. Yeah, um, I do. And again, it's great that uh, Tom mentions Edith Hanke. Um, I've had a lot of help from uh, from Weber scholars, and I also want to thank thank them from uh, engage for engaging with this uh, with this Marxist reader Weber. And they've been very generous, by the way. This uh, I didn't want to leave this unmentioned. Um, yeah, I think. There are some elements. So the way, for example, Weber has some criticisms of uh, leftist organizations, for example, where the way he talks about charisma and he, he Weber shows, and again, uh, that depending on how a revolutionary organization is structured or how it sets its goals, that it's almost impossible to discern it from a sect, from a religious sect. These are the kind of provocations that uh, it's like he's doing, he's saying it all, it necessarily becomes it. Uh, he's saying, he's not giving you an, he's saying, he's raising that point to say uh, any revolutionary movement becomes, it's it's indistinguishable from like a millenarist mystical, uh, you know, uh, uh, organization. But he of course gives, we have to prove him wrong. That's my relationship to him. It's he, in these kinds of criticisms, he finds something that is not baseless, that, you know, we are all familiar with uh, how sectarianism is prevalent in, um, in the left wing uh, spectrum. And so he does find an issue. He will uh, try to, he will say, well, if you have an activism that has no concrete project, it will it's the same as saying this kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. So he's, you know, saying you're you're like a, a Catholic mystic in that sense, which to some won't be a big problem. But uh, we we have to prove him wrong on that. We have to prove him wrong uh, on the question of the alternative. And so Weber works very well in the sense of wh what he says you can't go beyond is exactly where the issues that we have to face. And so he does help you map that and he does keep you uh on your feet as a as a leftist if you're if we're getting too endogenous in what we read we only read not that we don't have, that there are no conflicts within <laughs> within leftist thought for sure there are but uh he he helps you break with that endogenous um kind of tendency and keep you sharp uh in that way 
and of course with conceptual um with conceptual production he he's such a he he built such an elegant uh, logical system the 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 sociology of domination is like this uh logical marvel i mean to figure it out that's why people become so fascinated and they get into the get into it, don't understand anything. Then when they finally get it, they can never get out. And the trick is to understand it, but not become entrapped by it. And so, <laughs> so that's, he keeps you sharp and that's, and, and leads you to the right questions, even if he, his answers are not ours. And even if he's presuppositions and what he leaves silent is exactly what we have to bring to light. Um, I have to give it to them that Weber is, is a thinker who, is attempting to uh, find his biases and and attempting to engage with uh, you know these students of his uh, enjoyed interacting with Weber Biograph in terms of a biographical none of them will say uh, he they all uh, had a thought he was a good adversary and uh, someone who at least knew how to listen to the other uh, to the other camp not always right uh, he also had you know what he says about Rosa Luxemburg is not, uh, for example, is not a fair adversary. Uh, or a, a, he was very much not had no problem with Liebknecht and Luxemburg being murdered. But so let's not again. <laughs> let's keep that in mind. But that Faber keeps you on on edge and uh, raises the question of self critique and of a non endogenous uh, view of the left, right? Every Marxist has them. If uh, Gramsci has uh, Croce and uh, even, you know, you have to have your pet uh, bourgeois conservative, but a good one. There, there, there are not many in the current crop or any of them actually that you can really read and say there's anything that you take away from them. That's not the case with Weber at all. And maybe a final thing, uh, also, uh, it was up to a Marxist to organize the Weberian. So if you're more interest, interested in Weber and stuff, uh, there's this network that uh, of Weber scholars. If you want to, want to get into the meaty kind of stuff, uh, it's called Weber Scholars Network. If you Google that, WeberScholarsNetwork.net, which uh, heretical uh, readers of Weber like me and Tom and uh, Angela and Sarah are in and but also more uh, orthodox ones and we have uh, we have great opportunities to, to discuss and go into Weber's work uh, so if, if that interests you guys uh, check out the Weber Scholars Network. It makes me think I should have called my comment enemies with benefits rather than friends with benefits and that makes sense yeah. Or maybe frenemies with benefits. <laughs> frenemies with benefits. That's like too many like slang words, but I like that. Too much going on there, yeah. Um, are there any final comments from our speakers? We don't have any more uh, questions. Um, if you'd like to make a final comment, this would be a good time. And if not, um, then we can draw this to a close. Thank you uh, to our panelists and especially thank you to uh, Victor, I'll echo, echo Sarah. Thank you for writing such an important and brilliantly argued book, Victor. Um, I'd like to remind people that this is uh, the uh, Historical Materialism book series is our uh, host and our sponsor for this, uh, for this event. Um, and Go check out Victor's book. <laughs> yeah, it will come out in a more affordable uh, paperback edition with Haymarket.